Thank you. <coughs> um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Netways, my first ever limo ride. Awesome. Don't really know how to sort of process it, but yeah, it's, it's awesome. Uh, with that, I am, as they said before, Michael Medin from Stockholm, Sweden, and I'm here to talk a little bit about Windows monitoring with NS Client++. Plus Plus. But we'll also talk a little bit about Unix monitoring, so it's not just for the Windows guys. Uh, for those of you who saw me last year, I told you that I read this book about presentation. Now I read another book, which was about public speaking. So uh, they said you have to involve the audience. So the only way I could think of doing that was doing a whole you know, quiz at the beginning. So, anyone here who's using NS Client++, please, hands up. Right, so some people were actually here intensively. The next question is, of course, how many people like NS Client++? Yeah. <laughs> but there is, there is one guy at the back which I've actually paid to put his hand up. Uh, so, so, it's not, no. And how many people think it's simple to use NS Client++? <coughs> Yeah, no one at the back this time, yeah. <coughs> uh, but that's a good thing, because that's what I'm here to change. Now, uh, please, what's 3 plus 8? Right, no one had that many hands. Uh, so, uh, final question is, how many people saw me last year? All of you, awesome. Uh, because I've, every year it seems kind of silly to do a 15 minute talking about myself and then 15 minute talking about what NS Client++ Plus Plus is. So I've always tried to sort of make it slightly shorter, but I never know if it's the same people coming or just new people, but it's the same people. So next year there will be no introduction. This year there will be a little bit introduction because of course I am Michael Medin, so I need to talk about myself. And the only thing you really need to know about me is I'm dev, not ops. This means that I like to build shit. I don't like to, to look at them when they're running or figure out if they're running or anything. I like to build them and then just move on to build something else. So in that regard, I'm different from a lot of people. But now with the whole DevOps movement, that's a good thing. Uh, because it means that I might actually have something which could be useful. And the only thing you really need to take away from my presentations is just talk to your developers. They actually know how to monitor your stuff. Uh, no one talks to me when I'm developing things. That's why I'm trying to bring the message. Uh, the reason why I'm here is, of course, I worked in ops a long time ago. And uh, we were using Big Brother at the time, which sucked. So we moved to Nagios and, uh, well, there were no Windows agents. So I started to dabble with that, and uh, as I said, it's a long time ago. Not quite that long, but uh, nowadays I work with Oracle Fusion middleware, and uh, that's pretty much the face I do all day long. But we're not here to talk about me, we're here to talk about NS Client++. And usually this slide starts with saying it's written in C++, and I don't think anyone really cares. So I figured it might be better to say that it's an agent. Uh, it supports pretty much every paradigm there is, so you can do passive, active, real-time, etc., etc. Uh, it's sort of built to be a, a toolbox, not a specific tool for a specific problem. It's been around for quite some time. I don't know actually how long. The first commit is from February 14, 2005, but that was the entire program. So presumably it took more than five minutes to write. I think I started around 2003, but no idea. Uh, but if there is a conference in February in Two years' time, I will bring cake for everyone. Fortunately, the conference is in the fall, so that's not going to be an issue for me. Uh, it's, of course, a Windows agent up until version 040. Nowadays, it's a Linux and Windows agent, so it pretty much should work in most places. Uh, it's modular by design, and this is something I like, and this is the reason why I like Nagios, because Nagios, out of the box, can't really do anything. There is no way to send email, there is no way to check, there's no way to do anything. Everything comes with scripts and with things you add. It's the same with NS Client++, though it can actually do a couple of things out of the box. But the idea is that you should be able to extend it. It's also open source, which means that it is not open core. So no matter how much money you give to me, you will not get a better version. But feel free to try, I'm always open for more money. <laughs> <coughs> And of course, as I said, it's highly extensible, right? So you can extend it in with Python, with Lua script, with you know, modules, with you know, anything. Uh, of course, all the Windows script stuff as well. Uh, Over one was released, I think, about a year ago. Uh, might have been at the conference, don't remember actually, too long ago and too many beers ago. Uh, 
042 should have been released at the conference. Uh, then a couple of months back, I sort of started to think maybe I could do the release candidate, and now I'm just saying no. So uh, it's not going to be out in this month, maybe next month if we're lucky. We'll talk a bit about more of that later. 043 will be out early next fall. And now everyone is wondering, if it took one year, why is it not going to take one year? And the main reason is that 043 is not a major new revision. The idea is that 043 is 042 with bug fixes. So if you want to roll this into production, you might want to wait for 043 unless you know what you're doing. Uh, because 042 is a revolution, whereas 043 will be more of an evolution. Um, that said, please try 042, otherwise there won't be any bugs fixed, because I won't try it myself. Um, 041 is stable, so if you're using 039, 037, or 027, please stop. I won't even help you. Uh, and I know a lot of companies who are actually shipping 039, or a lot of companies, I wouldn't say that there's a company, won't name anyone. Um, it's also not just a program, it is also a project, right? Because it's an open source thing, so we have a community. You're looking at the community right now, by the way. Uh, except for, for the Icelandic guy who's actually helping out, it's awesome, never happened before. Apparently his co-worker was the previous guy that helped out four or five years ago. So uh, Iceland is apparently a big helper in the NS Client++ community. But this means that it is a one-man band, and since I like this picture, I keep to tend to have it in my presentation. This means that I'm the guy singing, playing the harmonica, the guitar, and driving the rocket to propel the car. Uh, not always a good thing. Sometimes it's a good thing, but it means that there is no company, no commercial version, or no paid time. And the reason I bring this up is because I always want to say, please don't be angry. A lot of times people ask me something and I promise to do it by Friday or tomorrow or tonight, and I just forget about it and come back six months later. Uh, I don't do this because I don't like you or because I you know, don't think you're important. I do this because sometimes I have to do other things. Uh, like sit around in a weird wooden car for no apparent reason at all, going to my grandparents, and you can see they're in a wheel, it's not going anywhere. No idea what they're on about. Uh, but that's uh, the way it is. We do have sponsoring donations, and I'm sort of thinking about support. The reason I'm thinking about support is not because I want to make this a big company, it is mainly because I want to have sort of a way to figure out what is important. Uh, nowadays people come to me, they ask for something, I implement it, and they never report back. And I figured if there was a support contract involved, maybe they would at least report back it worked or something like that. So if you're interested in that, or if you're interested in development, please let me know, because I have no idea how to do support. I work for Oracle, and essentially then you pay like a million bucks and you get nothing. I, I could easily do that, but, but I'm not sure you would pay me a million bucks for nothing. Um, so uh, please let me know if you're interested or your boss is interested, maybe. As I said, sponsors, a big thank you to my sponsors, OP5, Swedish company, which I guess they're not Swedish anymore, but they're from Sweden. Uh, we're Phoenix, Italian guys who do their packaged thing. Uh, Transitive Technologies, I don't really know what they're doing, actually. They should be doing everything. Uh, but they're like reselling OP5 and I think and all sorts of stuff. One Step 2 is uh, Austrian, I think, something. Uh, also has a pretty cool staff around now, I guess. Big thank you anyway. With that, we're going to talk about what's new with NS Client++, right? And I'm going to start off talking about 041, which is one year old. That's how new things is going to be. But what was new about a year ago was sockets, IPv6 support, SSL support. Uh, and when I say SSL support, I mean real SSL support, not the weird stuff they have in NRPE, which is just obfuscation. So you can get certificate-based authentication if you want. Uh, there are a couple of blog posts about setting that up, but I would probably wait for 042 because it's, uh, you need to build NS Client++ on Linux. That's a bit involved currently. Uh, but thanks to the Icelandic guy, it's going to be super easy in the next version. Hopefully. Uh, it also modernized all the checks. Uh, this means that things now work. And that's the problem for some people, apparently. Uh, for instance, timeouts now work the way they should. And most people don't understand the concept. So I thought I'd bring this to you, because I've gotten like 40 questions in the last month about why timeouts doesn't work. The way it is, is that you have something called network lag. So if you set a 10 second timeout on the Nagios side, and then you call a service over the network, 
and you set a 10 second timeout over here, it's not going to work out. Because when it's been 10 seconds over here, it's been 12 seconds over here. So there's no one to report back to. So what I'm trying to tell you is timeouts has to be smaller. So please set 15 seconds over here and 10 seconds over here, and you'll be much more happy. Uh, because timeouts now work the way they are expected to do. Before they were doubled, which meant that they always ended up being weird. Anyway, uh, a lot of new protocols. I'm not sure, is anyone actually using anything except check NT and maybe check NRP? No, right, so yeah, forget this slide then. Uh, Real-time monitoring, I was really ecstatic about it for event log and log files. And the, uh, uh, I don't know, but simplified command line syntax. Uh, there is a command line syntax. I won't judge it. And then we have this little guy, which I was so proud of. You know, I spent like five minutes with animations and was really a nifty slide. Uh, by the way, horrible slides last year. Seriously, I don't know what I was on. Uh, must have been my medication or something, but they look truly uh, horrible. Anyway, uh, nowadays in the news, uh, we've had this guy popping up. So forget this, the NSA can read everything. <laughs> yeah, we know that now. Uh, but it, it could have been encrypting, hello encryption and authentication, unless you're worried about the NSA. Uh, then it's not. Uh, the big thing about 041 though is that it was not finished a year ago, there's been minor revisions. The first one was in February, where we had a couple of new features. Uh, well, I had to re-add a check, which I accidentally removed. Coding support and a couple of other stuff like that. And then, a couple of months later, we had a new version. And uh, finally, a couple of months later, or this August, yeah, we had even fewer enhancements. Uh, these are generally small things or bug fixes, but please do check back periodically because there are newer versions, even if it's not a major new version number. Uh, but the idea is that you won't notice this, so this is just a service pack, whereas if it's 042, you will probably notice it in some way. With that, we're going to move to the future, and I do that by showing you a very old airplane, uh, which for me represents the future, even though it's not even flying anymore, but I think it's a cool plane. Um, it's of course the Concorde, if you don't see the, the long nose thing. And the idea with 042 was I sat down and figured I'd, I'd had to have some sort of agenda or ID. And the first thing was modern Windows support. And Microsoft has actually been changing Windows in many small but fundamental ways in the last few years. And I have quite frankly been doing other things, so NS Client++ hasn't really kept up. With 042, we've fixed that. So now we support all the new event logs, the new scheduled tasks, and all that kind of stuff. So everything should just work for you. Uh, it also means that we have sort of made everything slightly better because when we've sort of revisited it, we have, or we, I, <laughs> have uh, extended things and made things much, much cooler. Uh, the other thing was real-time monitoring, because I like it. So the idea is that real-time monitoring should be everywhere. It will not be everywhere, because it doesn't really make sense to have, for instance, real-time monitoring uptime, at least not for me. Uh, but it will be for, for a lot of things. So uh, the idea is to make it available in, in many more places. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later on. I talked about quite a lot about last year, but I'm going to give you some more use cases later on. Simplified monitoring, and this is of course the big one because NS Client++ is not simple to use, quite frankly. So the idea is that we're going to resolve that. And the problem it's not simple to use is that I developed it originally about 10 years ago, and then I've sort of been adding feature requests all over the place, which means that everything has sort of been going in all directions. Nothing works the same, nothing looks the same, and nothing is the same. So with 042, essentially we've thrown everything away, and we've rewritten all the checks based on the filters syntax, which I'm going to demonstrate later on as well. Uh, so the idea is that everything works exactly the same. Uh, with all checks. So hopefully it will be much, much simpler to use. Uh, I've also gone in a different direction when it comes to defaults. Previously, when you just ran the command, it would just bother you, if you're lucky, saying you need this option as well. Usually it didn't tell you anything. Uh, but nowadays, if you just run a command, it will give you what most people want, which means that if you don't have special needs, you perhaps don't even need to do any options whatsoever. But we're going to get into that a little bit later on. 
Also, Linux checks, because I think it's kind of silly to have one agent on Windows and another one on Linux, because it means that if you're going to do monitoring, you have to do it one way on these machines and another way on these machines for no real reason. So it's just twice as much work. So the idea is to make everything works the same regardless of which platform you're having. And this is a work in progress, but the idea is that the core checks should be supported on Linux in 042. Uh, with that, uh, we didn't really get the Concorde. Uh, instead, we got some sort of weird, crappy Duplo plane, which is badly assembled. Uh, but it is a plane. It has wings. So, um, but if you're looking at the status, um, this slide is from about a year, or a year, sorry, about a month ago when I was doing this or a similar presentation at the Nuggets World Conference. And at the time, modern Windows support was finished, which means that if you download the latest build, it will have all the new Windows stuff in it. Simplified monitoring was also done. Real-time monitoring and a CP protocol and the CHAC XXX. By the way, uh, for those of you who's been using NS Client for quite some time, there's no relation between the old domain name. Uh, and I'll leave that as an inside joke for the three guys who might understand it. Uh, but Linux Chex was not even started. Now it's been a month, so there's been some development, and uh, essentially real-time monitoring and check clients are finished. So the only thing missing is Linux Chex and NSCP protocol. And the good thing about those two things are they're non-essential. So the idea is that once I get home, I will try to do a release candidate fairly quickly, and then sort of drop these in one new at the same time when you're doing bug fixes. So if we release it in a month or something, they will be there. Uh, but we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> there is the one thing which is not mentioned on this slide, and that's the fact that all checks have a new command line syntax. And some people have the old configuration or the old commands in their configuration. So uh, there has to be some way to handle the compatibility so that people don't have to redo everything when they're upgrading. And that's not finished at all. I started it on the plane here, so I've done check CPU now. And I've done check uptime last, late last night. But we still have a couple of other commands which will come, so probably be a week or two before the release candidate is out. But we're quite near the finish line. Um, yes, so what can you expect? Well, there's a new check called check OS version, which not unsuspectingly, will give you the operating system version, the fixed packs and that kind of stuff. Uh, we have check process, which was there before, but didn't really do much. Uh, nowadays, it works pretty much like task manager, except you can do checks on it. So you can check how much memory the process is using, how many handles it has, or, or how long it's been running, or anything like that. So I think that's sort of showing the direction we're going in, because check process is pretty cool right now. Uh, check page file is a new check to check in the page file. A lot of people have been trying to check the page file usage using the memory command, but unfortunately Windows doesn't really work that way. Because the page file in the memory context is what Windows has sort of told the guys that we can do. It's not what it has actually delivered. So if a process comes along and says, hello, I want four gigabytes of memory, Windows will say, yeah, sure, go ahead and it won't do anything about it until it actually starts to use the memory. This is why check memory, the page area, or the committed bytes, which is called as well, doesn't really show how much virtual memory you're actually using. It shows how much virtual memory you might be using or you could be using. Uh, but check page file shows you the actual utilization of your page files on your various drives. And this one is where I expect everyone to stand up and clap. No? OK. Uh, performance data counters, or performance data helper, I guess it's called, is total rubbish. It's probably the worst thing Microsoft has ever implemented. For those of you who don't know it, it's a way to get metrics from your computer. The problem is it just works on English computers, sometimes, when they're not, not working for no apparent reason at all, uh, or when they're just saying negative denominator index or something like that. No one has ever figured out what that actually means. Or, or how to solve it, but it's not related to NS Client++, it's related to performance data helpers. And we're no longer using them. So check CPU, check memory, all of those are going on the, the native APIs. Which means that, henceforth, all the core checks will just work. And I promise you there will be no weird, strange issues. That said, we never know. Uh, you can still use performance data checks if you want to check you know, SQL Server, memory, status, and that stuff. So it's all still there. It's just that the core checks are no longer relying on top of it, which means that hopefully 
everything should work much, much better. Uh, check service has been extended to support one of the most requested feature, which is, of course, delayed start. Um, and it also checks or, or supports remote checking and a couple of things like that. And NRPE client should probably say check NRPE. The idea here is that because the NRPE protocol in NS Client++ supports authentication and encryption and all that kind of stuff, the regular check NRPE command doesn't. Uh, so I sort of wrote my own. And right now you can do this with the regular NS Client++, but it's kind of a bother because you need to start the entire agent and boot everything up and then you can run your check inside it. Now there will be a dedicated client which will be much easier to use and much easier to install and compile on Linux. So, uh, with that, we're going to sort of look ahead a bit. Notice the uh, red color. This is me lying to you. Uh, and of course, we have to have the, the enterprise. And by the way, for anyone, this is from, from the Intrepid Museum in, in New York. This is not an actual space shuttle. It's just a model. And, and I, I paid like $25 to see the space shuttle. Uh, total ripoff. Uh, but at least I got a picture for my slide. Oh, sorry, yeah, I was supposed to talk as well, not just explain my nice trip to the New York. Anyway, Linux packages, thanks to the Icelandic guy, and uh, I, I can't thank him enough. He has a presentation tomorrow, I think, on Adagios, awesome stuff, go see it. I, he, he actually paid me to, to say that. Uh, so, probably don't want to see it. Uh, quality improvements. Uh, of course, as I said, 043, the idea is that uh, it should be a bug fixed version of 042. Uh, there will be auto detection of things so that uh, you will be able to sort of figure out what to do. Uh, right now, in 042, all the thresholds are set at percentages, and the idea is that with 043, you will be able to, first of all, configure them if you want to, but also have them adapt dynamically to you know, your environment. Um, scripts will be, well, it not be possible to script it, you can already do that. The idea is that it will be shipped with some scripts that actually does some useful stuff. And hopefully there will be a Dadios integration, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, I think that the web interfaces need to talk to the plugins to figure out what to do so that when you're configuring things, you should be able to get the help inside the web interface. And I think that would be pretty cool. But we'll see. Um, with that, we're going to leave the future and talk about what's here and now. How am I doing on time, by the way? Mm, not so bad. Uh, have anyone using check event log? S seriously, this is sad. Do you, do you guys know that I spent like three months working, you know, eight hours a day <laughs> to get the filters working on that one? Well, um, anyway, filters is uh, awesome, I think. Um, Started out a long time ago when I sort of, yeah, I could do parser, easy. Yeah, it took me five hours. Then I figured out that once you parse something, you actually need to interpret it. That's not easy. Uh, so that took me three months. Uh, but we now have filters, and that's a good thing. Um, consider a log file of some kind. It could be the event log, it could be a text file, it could be pretty much anything. We have something called level and source. Level is, of course, the type of message, and source is where the message comes from. And we could, for instance, be interested in all errors. So the way this works in many plugins is that you type weird options, and then you stack on something. With filters, you say level equals error. And I think even if you went to your grandmother, she would probably understand this. Because if you read it, it sort of makes sense. Okay, so if the level is error, right? Uh, and that's sort of the idea, because once you have all these nifty options, it's usually a bit difficult once you start doing this in a bigger scenario. Whereas this is natural language or close to, which means that if you come in and you're going to change something, it's probably easier to do it if you can actually read it than having to understand how the options interconnect. Uh, and we can, of course, do the same if we want to have source equals app1. Uh, she would probably not understand app1, but if you said Excel or Word, and she's actually been using those programs, she might understand the concept. Now, if we take our example with app1, we can, of course, extend this as much as we like. So we can quite easily add app3 as well. 
by just saying source equals app1 or source equals app3. And we can keep going and say, yeah, let's get all errors as well, but just stacking on another or level equals error. And the thing is, you can still sort of read this and understand this. And anyone who knows SQL, is there anyone who knows SQL, by the way? Uh, I'm, maybe I'm from Oracle space, so I have to know the database, but, but yeah, I would expect it more. But this works the same, right? Um, and of course, we can keep going as much as we like, add more stuff. But here comes the sort of tricky bit, because this is quite easy to do with options. You can just have, you know, a level options and then stack them on top. But once someone comes along and says, yes, but I don't want this, it becomes much more difficult. Because then all of a sudden, all of these options have to somehow relate to this option. And there's a quite a big difference by saying, I want all the errors, but not from Excel, or saying I want all the messages, but not errors from Excel, for instance. Uh, and doing those kind of details becomes very, very tricky. That is why I think this is really what we need. So the idea here is that I can just put a little parenthesis about all these guys and say and source not Excel to exclude them. But if I wanted the error messages from Excel, I could sort of change this expression into being that, and I would still understand it. At least I would understand it. Hopefully you will understand it as well. But I've said that many times before, and I think up weird stuff that no one understands, unfortunately. Yeah, that's me. Um, but the end result would, of course, be this guy, which is a bit of typing. So to shorten it a bit, we can use the in syntax, which just say if source is this or this or this or this, or level is this or this or this, but not this. We can go on. So, do people understand this? Does it make sense for someone? Yeah, well, that's the good thing. Uh, but it doesn't have to be an event log. It could just as well be, you know, the load on your core or your CPU, or it could be, you know, memory usage, or it could be, yeah. Sorry, yeah, there should be one more. Ah, oh, well. Shouldn't there be like a file slide? Well, well it, it could be anything, really, and that's, that's the thing. So this works for everything the same. And I think it's not sort of accidental that Microsoft has done the same thing with WMI. Uh, so I think, I think it actually makes sense. Now, the reason why I think this works is because of this. Uh, a guy came to me in the forum saying, no, it doesn't work. And I was like, yeah, it does. No, it doesn't work. Could, could you show me your filter? And this is what he came back with. <laughs> and I was like, what on earth are you doing? <laughs> but, but he apparently needed this. <laughs> Hopefully, you don't. <laughs> but if you do, it does work. <laughs> but the thing with this is that you can never do this with options. It's impossible. But you can if you have a filter expression, because you can build it as a structural tree. So what can you do with filters? Well, of course, numbers. We have greater than, equal than, less than, all of those kind of normal stuff. We also saw the like operator, or sorry, in operator, which is for checking if a value is in a list. Uh, if we look at strings, we get a couple of more. Uh, don't really know why greater than and less than makes sense for strings. But is there if you feel you want to go that route? But we also have like and regexp, which is regex matching and substring matching, uh, which is quite useful if you want to do string comparisons. Um, so you can do quite a lot of things with this. And now perhaps you're wondering that how does this work with Nagios? Because Nagios doesn't want to have a list. Nagios want to have warning or critical, right? No. Ah, well, that's what I thought. Anyway, the way this works is that the filter will define what you get back. So that is what you're interested in. Think of it as the window you're looking through, right? Uh, then you have another filter, which works exactly the same, but it's called warning. And anything that matches that filter will return the message as a warning to Nagios. And of course, there's one for critical as well. So if we want to sort of go through this, for the people who maybe didn't understand me, the idea is that if we do filter source equal app1, we scrap all these other lines, right? And then we add another one where we say warning level equals warning, which means that that little guy will become a warning in Nagios. 
And of course, we could put a critical one for the error line and we would get an error in Nagios instead. The last thing we need to know about filters is display. Because a lot of people came and they were like, yeah, I want to have this syntax. And I said, yeah, it makes sense. I'll go with it. Three weeks later, another guy comes by and says, yeah, I want this syntax. And I was like, eh, too late. Already gone with that one. Shame on you. Uh, if you snooze, you lose. But the idea here is that here you can change it. So we have custom strings where you provide whatever syntax you want. And we can put in these little guys inside to replace them with you know, keywords. A bit like if you're writing macros, then you have the dollar something dollar thing. Same thing, only this syntax looks cooler. Uh, there's two of them, top level and detail level. And sort of trying to explain the difference, if we have the detail level syntax as colon source, the top level syntax could be hello list. Now, if you remember, this was a table, right? So you have several rows. For each row, we will be rendering this string and putting it in this list. So the end result is hello and s colon app 1, s colon app 2, s colon app 3. And this way you can control the syntax pretty much the way you want it. The only thing you cannot change right now is the comma sign. Maybe in a future version, we'll see. But hopefully this will be able to give you the syntax you want. And a couple of examples. Check page file. We'll check all your page files. So we'll check your C drive, your D drive, your E drive, your F drive, your whatever drive you have. Most people are probably only interested in the total. And then you can say, well, filter name equals total. And you only get the total file. Because we won't look at the C drive or the D drive or the E drive. We will only consider the total. Or check uptime. We can say warning something, critical something, to sort of define when it's, an, or when it's a warning or not. This is probably the bad example, because the whole date thing is a bit weird. That's me. I should trademark it. No one will use it. Uh, or perhaps a more interesting example, we're using check process, checking explore.exe, making sure that the working set is uh, below 70 megabytes of memory. But here's the interesting thing. What we wanted to show was the working set, the number of handles it's using, and how much user time. So the syntax doesn't really correlate to what we're checking. So if we want to return more information, we can do that. We could, of course, have been checking a lot of other stuff here as well, but we were sort of free to do this either way. We can check something or we can return it. We don't have to have the same information in both places. So does this may seem simple? Yeah, that, that, was, that was a pretty weak response. And uh, maybe some people are, are saying that it seems like a lot of typing, right? You know, a lot of filters, syntaxes, warnings. And, and here's really where the next thing comes in place. And that's sensible defaults. So if you look at check CPU, that just works. No options, no filters, no syntax, not even a detailed syntax. Check CPU without command line options. We'll check your CPU load for the last, I think it's five seconds, 30 seconds, and five minutes, or something like that, and check that it is within sensible bounds. And as I said before, in 043, you will be able to configure what sensible bounds are. So you will be able to say that, OK, this is what my profile is. Now I just want to check it. Uh, and as I said, the thing is that all of this is pre-configured out of the box. It just works. So the idea is that this should actually be pretty simple whereas perhaps before it was not. And if you want to do something weird, like the guy with the slightly big filter, you can. So, real-time monitoring. Uh, do you guys remember from last year what real-time monitoring is? The whole audience interaction thing doesn't really work very well. No. Must have been a bad book I read. Um, anyway, the general concept is that in Nagios, at least, there is two paradigms for monitoring. We have active monitoring, where essentially you have someone calling your machine, asking them their status. The example I had last year was if you break your, break your leg, you have your prearranged with your doctor to call you every five minutes asking you, have you broken your leg? Have you broken your leg? 
it will probably bother after like 10 minutes uh, because it's much, much easier to actually call the doctor and say, hey, you know, it hurts like, uh, yeah, a lot. Um, and that's really a better paradigm, I think. Then we have passive monitoring, which a lot of people started using because Nagios sucks at forking, or previously did suck at forking. And essentially, what we're doing is we move the errors to this side. Instead of Nagios or your monitoring server asking you how you are, you're calling your doctor saying, no, I haven't broken my leg. No, no, no legs broken, no legs broken. Uh, and still, it's a lot of traffic for very little information. So the idea is, with real-time monitoring, is let's tell you when something happens. You know, when you break your legs, you can just say, now it hurts. And the beauty of this is that most people want to have the error message very, very quickly. And if you're doing poll-based checking, regardless of if it's passive or active poll-based checking, it's still delayed. So it will take you, if you're unlucky, five minutes before you know that something has happened. Whereas if you're doing it in real time, you will tell you instantly. So you will get a message back exactly when it happens, or close to exactly. You will get it a few nanoseconds afterwards, or you know how much network lag you're having. Uh, so I think it makes sense. Uh, not always. There are some instances when it doesn't make sense, but I think it makes sense for a lot of things, especially log file checking, for instance, which usually is quite a lot of overhead because you need to parse the logs and that kind of thing. But we're going to talk a little bit about other use cases. And as I said, zero overhead log file checks was the one I had last year, because that's where I implemented this. And the reason why I can send zero overhead is the fact that it's using kernel events, so there's no polling involved whatsoever. The Linux operating system or the Linux kernel will tell NSClient++ the file has changed now. So it's, it's quite fast in that regard. Uh, but you can do a lot of other things. For instance, you can do composite checks. Uh, a good example of this is if you have a log um, or a computer which logs I am broken and then a bit later logs I'm okay. It's kind of difficult to do this with the normal way you do logging or log checking because often you just check for a certain condition and then you sort of time out after five minutes or ten minutes or something like that. But quite often there is actually a message saying now it's fine again. So the idea is that you can set up multiple filters and say okay if we get this one send this service check as bad. If we get this one, send this service check as good. So we can use this to create composite checks where we have different filters sending data on the same service check so we can actually capture the return state. We can also do stateful monitoring, and this is sort of the same thing, but with stateful monitoring we're looking at what happened before. Did we get this message for five minutes ago? Maybe we don't need to report it now. Was the last message the same message? Oh, let's not report it. They already know. Or perhaps, you know, did the last CPU load was, you know, about this level? Maybe this level is fine, which perhaps makes more sense for disk checks or something like that. Let's do the trend, you know. How much is the disk changing? Has the trend line changed or is it the same growth? Uh, is the system not behaving the way it used to be? And I hope that the last session tomorrow, is it, which is on, on uh, what's it called? Yeah, not setting thresholds. I think that will be a bit about these kind of things. Because I think this is really the future. And I know this guy from the US who monitors a lot of stuff. And essentially, they get hundreds of new machines coming in every day. So they don't really have time to do all of these threshold setting and that kind of thing. Uh, so we sort of get into the next thing. I mean, maybe you could use this to do adaptive thresholds. Maybe you could just write a little Lua script somewhere that would just say, OK, now it's not fine anymore, because it's not Christmas. It spiked this way last month, but now this happened. This is, of course, nothing that it will do out of the box. But with stateful scripting and real-time checks, you can do it. So you have the tools to build it on top of it. The last thing, which I think also is something we're needing, is correlation or complex event processing. Uh, for instance, the CPU load might not really tell you anything, but it might tell you something if another thing, I mean, for instance, if you have high CPU load but a low transaction count, that might be very bad because all of a sudden you're doing a lot of things without doing any work. But in itself, high CPU load might not be bad. 
or in itself a low transaction count might not be bad. So the thing is, you start to look at how these different metrics correlate with each other. And to do that, you need a script which spans a single check. You can't have one script to do that. You need to have a script which sort of checks what this guy is doing, and what this guy is doing, and what this guy is doing, and forms a picture of the total to figure out what the status is. Uh, so I think that stateful checking or, or stateful script and real-time monitoring is really something we need moving forward. Then I got a question last time I did this, but how about graphing? Because some people like graphs. And I usually think this is the answer. You pretty much have two options. You can either store or fetch them from the cache, or you can submit them passively. But there is a big bot coming, and that's this guy. But not to Nagios. Nagios is not a data warehouse. Nagios is a monitoring solution. It cares about states. Submit your graph data to Graphite, or you know, if you have a real data warehouse, use that. Because then you can actually do something with this data. Uh, and I think it doesn't really make sense to run the check every five minutes just because you want to feed your graphing system. You can do that some other way. Um, so I think this makes sense, and you can still do the whole, yeah, I want to have the graphs, and you want to have all of these stuff. But please, not Nagios. The last thing we're going to cover is agentless monitoring. And a lot of people sort of like this concept. I personally dislike it, so I'm a bit partial to, to not using it at all. The idea, though, is that we can actually do it, because most of the Windows native APIs support checking or support talking to remote computers. So out of the box, with NS Client++, we can actually do a lot of agentless monitoring without installing things. And since a lot of people are talking about agentless monitoring, the idea is that we're hopefully going to bring this even further in the near future. But the good thing about using NS Client++ for this is that it is secure, it is much simpler, and it is much, much faster. And of course, lightweight, because if you're running this from Nagios, you will have to go and fetch a whole bunch of metrics and put this together, and you need to put a lot of you know, weird uh, domain passwords in text files somewhere and that kind of stuff. So it sort of makes sense to put NS Client++ on a machine and just do it from there, because then you can use all the built-in protocols, all the built-in stuff inside Windows. Um, but it is a huge work in progress, so it exists for some checks, uh, but as I said, hopefully in the near future it will be much more expanded. So what you can do, well, that's the wrong transition. Well, need to work on my slides, apparently. What you can do right now is check service for checking a remote computer. Disk drive can check remote computers. Ska ta task schedule can check remote computers. And of course, VMI can check remote computers. So this is what you can do right now, or what you have been able to do for quite some time. What the idea is, Seriously. Uh, wrong transitions. Anyway, uh, so, and the idea is that it would be quite easy to do a remote deployable agent, which would be installed similar to PSXEC. For those of you who don't know about it, the way PSXEC, PSXEC works, and that's a way to remotely execute commands on Windows, what it does is actually it copies a file to the remote computer, and it installs that as a service, and it tells the service to run the command, right? And we could do pretty much the same thing. So we could, from NS Client++, go to the remote computer, copy a small file, and tell him, start this guy, report metrics to me. And all of a sudden, you would have agentless monitoring for CPU memory processes. But more importantly, and this is really the reason why I don't like agentless monitoring, you can't do external scripts. And that's a big problem. If your monitoring structure is built on the fact that you can never extend it, then you end up with something like you know, HP OpenView or, or IBM, is it Tivoli or whatever it's called, their monitoring thing. And they tend to be very expensive and not very extendable. And the problem is that your solution can generally not be monitored with it. It's not, I mean, they won't have an agent or a plugin for your whatever home build system you're running. Uh, so you generally always need external scripts. And the idea here is that we would actually be able to do agentless monitoring with external scripts, which I think would be actually a nice feature. And all of a sudden, agentless monitoring would make sense. So, monitoring simplified is what I started with, right? 
on my title. And uh, cautiously, I had the question mark there for those of you who didn't notice it. So uh, regardless of how this turns out, I haven't lied. So this is what we started out with, right? How many people think this is simple? And what we've sort of progressed through is this slide. So let me ask again, how many people think this is simple? Oh, that's, that's not so good. Uh, sucks. Uh, I'll have to do better next year. I promise. It'll be awesome. And with that, I'm going to leave you with a big thank you. And, or, well, I won't leave you. I'll be here for questions, which is the next slide, by the way. So, uh, are there any questions? And I, I would like to sort of start off by saying that at Nagus World, there were like five, ten minutes worth of questions. So, uh, if we want to compare conferences, <laughs> yeah, just hit me. Okay, questions? Come on. Yeah. Now, Nagus World next year, no open source. Well, they had a limo, actually. I might come just for that. Yeah. Makes up. But seriously, questions, come on. Something. I'm only here, here once a year. Uh, I, ha I haven't used NS Client++, but uh, you mentioned Graphite, and I'm using Graphite currently a little bit, and I'm trying to extend it. Um, don't you think that uh, sending the metrics directly to Graphite is, uh, is a proper solution? Absolutely, which, which is why there is a plugin to do exactly that, built uh -huh. into NS Client++. Okay. So you can just say, you know, let's send the, the metrics to Graphite and let's send whatever stuff we have this way to Nagios. So that's definitely what I think you should be doing. Problem is, what I've heard is that Graphite is sort of abandonware, so hopefully there will be another solution coming along. But I, I think Graphite is awesome myself. I think it's really, really slick and nice. So, so was that it? Now, oh, come on, seriously, questions? Do we have a possibility to have an influence on on how data is aggregated or prepared or filtered when sending it to to Graphite? How? Well, it's just sent. It just sends <laughs> single events, counters. Uh, Does it pre-aggregate? Uh, well, essentially, what, what you do if you want to use uh, Graphite or use the Graphite plugin, uh, in uh, NS Client, there's something called a channel. And the channel pretty much works like an NSA. We can submit information on it. So if you have a data source which submits information, you can direct that data source. And normally, you do that to the NSA server. But you can say, yeah, let's do it to the NSA server and Graphite. And then the Graphite plugin will use a rule-based thing to figure out what the names for the, for the metrics are and just ship all of that often to Graphite. So that's sort of the way it works. It's probably easier to explain with a picture, but there's no whiteboard, unfortunately. So we're all out of luck. Uh, before we leave, I, I have to take this photo thing. Oh, yeah, there is a question. Awesome. Yeah, the Icelandic guy. Yeah, he's just paid to ask questions, if you're wondering. Uh, I was about to get no free beer tonight. Yeah, so hit me. You uh, mentioned something about uh, check underscore under PE. So yes. Client part. How does that work? Will we still have that 1K limit or whatever it is? Uh, well, uh, yeah. But the good thing is that in NS Client++, that's soft configurable. So if you want to change the 1K limit, you can do that. But the protocol is built on the fact that it is 1K. What I have planning to do is once we have this out, there is something called NSCP protocol, which will be a bit like NRP without the bad stuff. Sounds awesome. Yeah. And that will come in 042, by the way. But it will be pretty new. I, maybe just uh, to come back to Graphite again. Um, <laughs> Did I get it right that you extract the metrics and then you forward it to Graphite? Yes. Or don't you think it's better to let some, or let, I don't know, uh, let a, an agent extract the metrics and send it to Graphite and then you check on the Graphite backend so that you do not uh, be in the middle, but it's because it's someone else. Well, well I am the agent. Okay. So I'm just running the check and sending it to Graphite. Okay. Much like I could be sending it to NSCA or. Okay. SMTP or syslog or 
other but weird you ways. You could also check some metrics that is uh, extracted from. Ah, okay. Else. You mean go to to to, to graphite and and yeah, yes. that would be interesting, but that's not supported. Uh, I've <laughs> I, I've actually looked at doing that, but for RRD because it's, it would be closer to home. Unfortunately, RRD does not really have an API for reading data. But don't you uh, think that this should be the future? Yeah, it, it, it could be argued, but something like that. As I said, the whole thing is that you need to have the metrics somewhere. But I think you shouldn't go and pull them from a database. I think you should just filter the income extreme. So essentially, if you put yourself as a, like a firewall in front of all the data, and you just suck it inside and process it in real time, that would be better. But yes, you could also go and fetch it from the database. But it usually becomes kind of slow when you need to fetch things from the database, which is why complex event or processing usually do it in real time in memory. Uh, but yes, that something like that would definitely be, be in the future. And um, have you looked into ZeroMQ or some public subscription? There is a couple of ZeroMQ plugins actually as well, so yeah. Okay. okay. But Thanks. that's mainly for sending it from NS client here to NS client there. Okay. Thanks. Oh, one question. You sparked them. Uh, your scripting language uh, is really awesome. I like it. And uh, the question is: Is it possible to extract this as a component and integrate it into a different application, such as my my top ng for running some kind of checks like you are doing? Mm, you can you can sort of use command line to execute checks. Yes, but it's a bit clunky. But you can do it. Uh, the idea, though, and that will hopefully make it into 043, is a REST API. Yeah, but I mean, y your language, you spent uh, a lot of time, you said, okay? So it's not available as a library so that it can be... Oh, uh, oh, you meant the filtering stuff? Yeah. Uh, no, well, it is a library in NS Client++, but it's not. Uh, if anyone wanted it, they could probably, I could probably do it as a library, yeah. I want. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> um, you talked about the correlation CEP. Um, yes. Check, so what will it be the, um, yeah, the possibilities or is what are well, the uh, restrictions let, to let, those? Let's, let's, let's just say that th those things are things you can build with the technology. So it's not like there is a built-in CEP. But what you can do is, since you have scripts running across NS Client++, you can start doing the metrics. And there will probably be a CEP engine eventually. But what, what the idea is that, since all the data is just pumped through NS Client++, we can have a script, you know, oh, we have something here, we have something here, and sort of just figure out what to do with it. Okay, so, so it will be possible to say, okay, if my, I have three different checks and do some and or stuff on those checks. Yes, but you would have to write a script currently to do that. But yes, it's definitely possible to do that. Okay. Just a, <coughs> just a follow up. Um, if, you, if you're doing automatic uh, correlations with your scripts, wouldn't it then be better to have it based on an aggregate over all of your machines because you're monitoring, say, your load balancer and your app machine and your database, and sometimes you realize something weird is happening not by looking on one machine, but uh, seeing correlations yes, about... Yes, 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 yes. And again, if we're looking at the future monitoring, that's exactly what we need. Because if you have a big data cluster of Hadoop machines or something like that, you don't care if one machine goes down because you have 55 others over here. But you do care if, if 10 goes down. Right. Uh, so, but this is not something that Nagios is built to do, unfortunately. But the way I've sort of envisioned that is that, and that's why we have the zero MQ protocol, because what you could easily do is, is have a lot of agents fetching information, feeding them back up, and then processing that total information on a higher level. And then sort of sending a single check up to Nagios. So it's sort of an idea, but it's, it's probably not there yet. But if someone is interesting, I would pro definitely be interested in going in that direction. More questions? Yeah, this is awesome. Much better than Nagus World, yeah. Um, about the real-time monitoring, is yes. there some sort of a live message integrated? Because yes. the reason you, why you, you, you can set a timeout for the, okay. you know, if nothing is happening in five minutes, let's send, send this message and say, yeah, we're still okay. Because the reason you didn't call your doctor might be your dad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, and th I don't know if you were here last year, but that was the example because what happened to me uh, a summer ago was that my landlord came and knocked on the door and asked, yeah, we got some report that you might be dead. 
because I'd, I'd left the window open and the balcony door. I was st staying in a student town, so a lot of people left. So they sort of wanted to check that I haven't sort of gone home and left the doors and windows open. But uh, that was kind of weird. <laughs> Just a, a small, uh, for the Czech NRP, uh, I think there's a small patch for the Czech NRP which yes. just dynamically changes the buffer size. Yes. To multiple. Oh yeah. To multiple yeah, K and you, yeah, yeah. you integrate that, that also that, that, to an NS that client. That is supported as far as yeah. I know. It was supported anyway. I have tried it in a long time, uh, but that only changes the payload length returned, which means that if you have a long command line, it won't work. So that's a sort of a fix. But yeah, that should be should be fixed. Hi. Um, were you able already to test um, the NS Client++ Plus Plus with the new release of the Windows Server, Windows Server 2012 um, release 2? Actually, uh, no. N I did download something on TACnet recently, but I'm not sure if it was release 2, actually. But to be quite honest, uh, NS Client++ Plus Plus itself has pretty much worked on anything. So the, 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 the problems has been more like someone have changed the event log API for a new API, so you won't see the new messages. So I think the agent itself probably works. Now, I would almost guarantee that without having tried it. But there might be some checks that doesn't work the way they should or something like that. But I don't think I've tried it on R2 yet. So we're done? Can I get my photo? Are we going to look really bored or, or, or ecstatic? Yeah, there, there are two ecstatic guys over there. If you look at them and do the same. Come on. Woo! <laughs> Thank you.